Okay, I think we're ready to begin. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Kenneth Edlow. I'm the chairman of the board of the American Numismatic Society, and I want to welcome everyone here today. This is the 162nd annual meeting of the American Numismatic Society. Um, I'm the, a, for a quorum to be present, we need to have 20 fellows out of approximately 225, and <coughs> I'm advised by Joanne pr provisionally, she has at least 78 proxies, and in addition, there are m people in the room who m may not have submitted some proxies. So we have far more than enough, uh, so a quorum is present. The first order of business it will simply be the approval of the minutes of the meeting that took place a year ago on October 20th, 2018. Copies of the minutes were out on the table and I presumably were distributed to fellows at the time the notice of the meeting was sent. So can I hear, are there any comments or suggestions with respect to changing the minutes in any way? If not, can I hear a motion to approve the minutes? Okay, all in favor? Aye. All right, fine. We got through did that part. Okay, I will now turn the meeting over to our president, Sidney Martin, who will take you through the balance of the afternoon. Again, let me, let me echo Ken's uh, thanks for coming. Uh, it's good to see you all, and uh, I'm very pleased that we have as many as we do. I'd like to cover some things that have happened over the past year. Uh, and I'm going to focus on more the, the large scale sorts of things and then defer the specific accomplishments to the staff members responsible for them. It's been a very um, eventful year for us. Uh, there, there is lots and lots going on. In, in terms of the, the where we are, it's been a good year for us. We've had uh, contributions have been up. Uh, Membership is, is high. We've got more members have joined than what we've lost. Uh, it's been a, it's been a, a good year. Um, we actually, after a long hiatus, we have managed to hire a new curator for the American coins. Kind of goes with the American Numismatic Society, wouldn't you think, okay? And that, uh, that curator is Jesse Kraft, who is with us today. Jesse. Uh, Jesse was selected after an extensive search and interview process. Uh, very impressive. He, he even has a 1799 large set, okay, <laughs> which I, I was pleased to hear that. Um, the, w w one of the big picture items that have, have come up this year is <coughs> the, the fact we're in a transition period. We, we've, we, we are at a point where we need to make some real honest decisions. Uh, we're transitioning and beginning to transition in two ways. Uh, way number one is, is a sort of an obvious way, and that is that we are changing executive directors. We're not losing Uta entirely. She will stay uh, associated with the, the ANS, but she is stepping down as executive director. And at that point, I think we owe her a debt of thanks for getting us where we are. And I'd like to publicly <laughs> thank her. And to take Uta's place, we have Gilles Brownsburg, uh, who's been with us now for four years? Seven. And so he, it just seems, it, the time flies when you're having fun. Okay. So, so Gilles clearly knows the institution. He has been understudying Uta, and he agrees with everything she says. Um, so we, uh, we wish for Gilles the, 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 the longevity the, the, the success, the creativity that has been uh, expressed by Uta. The, the, the second aspect of transition is we've come to understand that your board, shame on us, we've never really, really dealt with the question 
of what we want to be when we grow up. What do we want to be? Do we want to be just exactly what we are now? Do we want to have additional curators? Do we want to fully digitize our library? I mean, what, what are we going to look like in the future? And that has wide replications in terms of where we might, you know, how, how we, if, if we can define what we want to be, then we deal with the question of, okay, how do we facilitate that, at least financially, and then how do we facilitate it uh, with facilities? And so we've undertaken um, a really uh, specific uh, strategic plan. Uh, the plan will involve each one of you, excuse me, <laughs> Roger Saboni. <laughs> Come to stand the contribution. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it will involve each of you. There, there. We have engaged a professional strategic planner who has helped the ANS uh, in years past, um, especially when we located into here. Uh, who will be uh, querying the fellows, querying the board as to what some of these questions, how they react to it, what, what, you, what you guys think. What do, you, what do you think we should be? Okay, do we, do we need an Arabic curator or not? I mean, there, there's just all these questions. And you, you will be getting questionnaires uh, that will help us uh, inform the decisions on how we do these other, other issues. Um, and I think that's uh, an absolutely important and a critical thing that is going to be facing us over the course of the next year. Um, I'm looking forward to it, kind of, the, the, the assessments that go along with that, uh, the debates that will go along with that, and uh, the decisions that will be made. <coughs> so that is something I think that's been five years in the making. We have now begun to actually address <coughs> the issue formally. Another thing I'd like to point out is the annual report for this year. I don't know if you've each gotten a copy. There are excess, the extra copies here on the back table. It's really, really nice. It's a credit to the staff, what they've done putting it together. Uh, it explains. It's a little different from your classical uh, annual report. It really delves into what the ANS is what we're trying to do, the, the kinds of things we accomplish, and please, if you haven't taken one, if you haven't looked at it, do so. After you've read it, give it to three of your friends, okay, and ask them to join too. So that's, that's the nature of my comments on the year. It's been a great year. It's been a great uh, foundation for moving forward, and I, I think we have only good things to look for in the future. And uh, at that point, I would like to call on, on Bob Candell to uh, come up, take over as chair of the Nominating and Governance Committee. And we have some business to attend to uh, uh, along those lines. Good afternoon. I'm Bob Candell, chair of the nominating and governance committee and I'm pleased to share my report with you today. <coughs> um, <coughs> the report was mailed to all fellows of the society as well as posted on the ANS website and copies are available at the back desk if you've not yet had a chance to take a look. Fellows of the society represent a maximum of 225 including our life fellows and our honorary fellows, honorary life fellows of the overall membership of the society. As of this afternoon, we have 221 fellows. I am pleased to report that pursuant to Article 3, Section 1 of our bylaws, five associate members were elected as fellows of the society at this morning's regular meeting of the Board of Trustees. And they are um, Ms. Elizabeth Hahn Benji of Chicago, Illinois, Mr. Christopher McDowell of Cincinnati, Ohio, Mr. Robert Rodriguez of Zephyr Code, Nevada, Dr. Scott Roddinghouse of New London, Connecticut, and Mr. Donald uh, Simon of New York City and Portland, Oregon. 
And pursuant to Article 3, Section 1 of the bylaws, the trustees have also elected Mr. Jerry Moran of Green Bay, Wisconsin, to serve as Honorary Life Fellow. Now we will proceed with the election of trustees. Fellows of the Society are entitled to vote at this meeting. Pursuant to Article 4, Section 6 of the bylaws, 20 fellows present in, in person or proxy shall constitute a quorum. All fellows present were asked to sign in. Will those fellows present who have not yet signed in please do so now with Joanne, our museum director, in the back of the room. Everyone is signed in? Terrific. If anyone is holding a proxy, please present them now also to Joanne. May I have two ANS members who are not fellows of society volunteer to count the proxies? Volunteers? Thank you, Peter. Number two? Number two? Jesse we Kraft. Pardon? Jesse Kraft. Oh, Jesse, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, we'd be here all day. <laughs> While they're counting the proxies, let me tell you the names of the following 13 trust trustee candidates who have been nominated for election or re-election for the terms ending 2020, 2021, and 2022. I believe most of the trustee candidates are here in person this afternoon. Will each please stand as I mentioned your name. For the term ending 2020, Beth Deicher of Sylvania, Ohio. Beth. Uh, Jonathan Kagan of New York City. Jonathan. For the term ending 2021, Mr. Scott Buck of Allentown, Pennsylvania, a new member of our board. Professor Kenneth Harl of New Orleans, Louisiana. I, Ken's not here. Dr. Noel Lenski of Woodbridge, Connecticut. Noel, nice to see you. Another new member. For the term ending 2022, Dr. Keith Barron of uh, Switzerland. My French is not so good. Um, <laughs> Michael Beale of Richmond, Virginia. Michael's also a new member of our board. Dr. Andrew Burnett of London. How'd that vote go today? <laughs> oh, just I'm just wondering. <laughs> Do I have the right color hair? Um, uh, Daniel Cohn of New York. I don't he's believe not he's not here today. Uh, David Hendon, also of New York. Lawrence Schwimmer of California and New York. He's not here. And Mark Tomasco, right? Mark Tomasco, also of New York City. Would a fellow please second the nominations? Thank you very much. Will those fellows who have not mailed in or handed in their proxies please raise their hands in approval of these nominations? Joanne, Uta, or uh, please uh, count and let me know when we have the count. 14? Okay. And now I'll ask uh, Joanne to please report the results. Plus 14, plus 14 for a total of? 92. <laughs> okay. For a total of 19 uh, two votes in favor of the slates that have been presented. And I thank you very much. The trustees have been elected. And now I would turn the meeting back to uh, Ken Edlow, who continued the meeting. Well, we're doing the report of the trustee according to Joanne. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you very much. It was just Yeah, I, I have. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to give the, I'm the treasurer, and uh, therefore I'm going to give you the treasurer report. It'll be rather brief. As you might remember a year ago, the, the endowment, the portfolio that the society owns, a year ago was worth $45 million and $16,000. As of September 30th, 2019, the end of our most, our 2019 fiscal year, the portfolio was worth 43,110,000. It had declined by $1,906,000. Now, you have to understand that we took out 2,090,000 was removed 
to pay the overhead of the ANS during that p the fiscal year 2019. Consequently, if you do the math, the portfolio itself gained 184,000 dividends and appreciation and realized gains. So for the year, we were up 0.42%. Uh, that is less than 1%. Um, at the, the Finance Committee during the year decided, though, to basically consolidate most all of the investing handled by our co-fiduciary in the hands of Vanguard Institutional Advisories. And that, the, the movement of $32.5 million in cash was sent to Vanguard during the month of September, and they immediately invested it in uh, both fixed income and equity securities. The, basically, the Finance Committee uh, decided it as a target, the, the total portfolio should be uh, committed 75% to stocks and equities and 25% to fixed income. Uh, a small part of the fixed income we're, I'm actually managing here in-house in preferred stocks and short-term high-grade bonds and so forth. Um, are there any questions? <laughs> okay, now can I turn it back to Sid, I think. <laughs> Or, we can yeah. or Dota? I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Okay. Just have to see how the, do I just forward I this? I think there's yeah, a yeah. Are you in order? Because it's, um... Do you have it? Yep. Yeah. 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 No, no. Do you have it? Let's see what happens. Um... All right. The report of the Executive Director. Welcome all. Um... I'm just, as in previous years, um, re-dividing this up. So I'm just giving a few highlights of the things that um, I was personally involved in or, you know, which falls sort of under the director um, <coughs> heading. And the first one is, let me see, that um, in the last year we awarded the 2017 uh, Sanford Salters Award to the Bulgarian sculptor and medalist Professor Bogomil Nikolov at a ceremony in um, Sofia. This was in October of 2018, where Trustee Mary Lannan, um, Mary somewhere here, and I actually attended this uh, ceremony, which was attended by over <coughs> 100 um, people. I would like to announce also at this point um, that the Board of Trustees of the Society has just voted to award the 2019 award, um, 2019 being the centenary of the Salters Award, to the um, artist, New York-based artist, Mashiko. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have to introduce Mashiko. She is, thank you, very well known. Um, and we hope to have in the uh, second week of December uh, an event that uh, in which we provide, um, which we will um, award the medal, but also have um, the chairman of the committee, Donald Skowinski, give a uh, talk on 100 years of medalists. Um, and we will have a little display here. I hope many of you, even if you're not interested in medals, are coming to that. I'm also happy to report that the award for 2020 um, went to the German sculpture and medalist Anna Franziska Schwarzberg. Um, in awarding this prestigious award to two women in the centenary year, um, the committee and the chairman, we all felt very strongly that the work of female artists in this field um, was rewarded, um, which had not been adequately reflected in the winners over the last two decades. So this is uh, particularly pleasing. Um, the American, uh, the American Numismatic Society awarded its highest academic honor, the Archer M. Hunting Medal, to Dr. John Kleberg on December fourth, where I, you can see, presented John. Um, uh, the medal, um, one of our former co colleagues, a numismatic scholar par excellence, as I put it then. 
And uh, the committee itself was, of course, impressed really by John's um, amazing variety of subjects that he um, has written on in the American field. And incidentally, his uh, lecture that he gave that day on uh, the theft of the large cent is probably one of the most popular ones on YouTube. Um, as you know, all this goes uh, there. I think it's still correct, Emma, isn't it, that this is? Um, I'm also particularly pleased um, to let you know that, in fact, at the trustees meeting today, um, the Board of Trustees awarded um, our president, Sidney Martin, with the Huntington Award uh, for the coming year. Congratulations, <laughs> Sid, for your work. Um, there will be a press release uh, coming out relatively soon on this, but I wanted to mention this. Um, the Medallic Art Company is, of course, one of the things that has occupied us considerably after following the um, purchase of the bankrupt company. Our staff and volu volunteers have dedicated them themselves to sorting through these tens of thousands of objects, dyes, medals, galvanos, and so on, um, as well as objects that we didn't have in the collection, such as my, as one ever know, favorite challenge coins. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to um, express my uh, Thanks to Jerry Moran, who was just um, elected an honorary fellow for his extraordinary help with storing the dyes, which is probably the most challenging um, aspect of all this. Um, they're in the, um, his at uh, Metalcraft in Wisconsin. The 900 boxes of uh, galvanos, plasters, and other things are still kept very safely in a facility in Nevada, but we're still looking for a place nearby to be able to sort through this material, um, in particular as we now have our new um, American curator in place. However, I would like to acknowledge here um, Taylor Hartley, an art historian who worked for the last year um, tirelessly um, on this material and, and um, did work on the spreadsheets and really did a lot of the work of going through the material that is here at the society where we have um, hundreds if not thousands of duplicate medals and other things um, that were just thrown into boxes which she organized. Um, she's off to graduate school and we wish her all the best. We are also very pleased that um, the checklist, this is one of the title pages that we have um, for this um, book that is coming out under the, um, in fact, book is the wrong word. It's a work in, I believe, three or four volumes, each volume the size of a Krause catalog. Um, 100 years um, of medals from the Medallic Art Company um, that is hopefully out by the end of the year. Um, it's just missing um, an introduction. And what that is, is a the checklist that we inherited or bought is perhaps the right word, not inheritable, <laughs> from um, the Medallic Art Company as a company. We added an index or a whole bunch of indices to this so that it will be, um, that medals can be more easily found. It is not a perfect work, but it is certainly the best um, that can be done. And um, Peter will say a little bit more in his own uh, presentation, but it remains for me to thank um, an anonymous foundation that stepped in almost immediately as we purchased this material with a gift of over $150,000 to support um, what was an extremely expensive um, purchase. As always, um, this is uh, an opportunity um, to take a moment of silence to um, remember the members of the society um, that passed away here. Um, Del Bland, Thomas Bostetter, Colin Bruce, Stanley Francis, Peter Gasper, one of our former trustees, um, James King, Milton Lynn, Richard Margolis, Leonard Gregory Mazone, William McDonough, who um, as head of the Federal Reserve Bank was the person instrumental in bringing the ANS into this extraordinary display we had for 10 years. I'm um, Greg Milberg and um, Thomas Wilfrid.
they will be missed. And I know many of you knew some of the people here. Um, they were all really um, great scholars. Um, in closing, I would like to thank everyone who has contributed so generously over the last year, and it has indeed been um, probably in the time I've been here um, one of the uh, absolute best years in terms of contributions. But I'd like to thank also all the donors, the volunteers, the staff of the society and the trustees. Um, in many ways for me this has been uh, a very difficult personal year, um, family-wise. Um, most of you know that my younger brother passed away. But it was made bearable really by being here and by being supported by members, staff and trustees. As this is my last annual uh, meeting as executive director of this organization, um, I would like to say a few words here. Um, how much I've appreciated to be allowed to be um, able to take care of such an extraordinary organization. We just heard it's the 162nd meeting, so we're all just caretakers. And that is the role that I've always seen myself in. Um, as many of you know who've been here for longer that uh, this has not been always an easy task, in particular in the early years of my tenure. But the vision set for the ANS over a century ago, and still more or less unchanged today, um, is to promote numismatics as a serious academic discipline while never forgetting that numismatics is also about collecting coins. I'm convinced that the strength of the society is built on these two components, which are at times at odds with each other. But the society's recent history proves that the right balance between amateurs and academia allows a coexistence and, as we can see in the ANS one, what I would say a happy one. We're living in times that are variously described as divisive, uncivil, polarized, you all know what I mean. But here at the ANS, I've never had the feeling at all that these times are on the outside. I'm absolutely convinced that the ANS has a very bright future ahead and because we're all united in this one goal that we put above everything else, which is these coins, this obsession with coins, I would almost say. Mm. And I'm extremely happy that my colleague and friend Gilles Bransbourg has agreed to be the next executive director because that allows me to finally return after a long hiatus to return to research. And I will remain at the society, but just work with coins and medals behind that wall as opposed to that wall. And um, I can't thank Gilles enough for having agreed to do that. So I would like to thank you, and I thank you all for all the help you've given me. Thank you. Oh, we, we, we actually have to... Uh,
Identification du clavier, shift. It's, it's telling me that I have to identify the keyboard. I have to do something here. I'll just, just put it into. Uh, Look, identification of a keyboard, it says. That's nothing, that's just the. Yeah. Um, that's, that's just the. Okay. But this is yeah, it's going to work. Yay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Peter. All right. All right. You want to put it on slideshow so you don't get the. Yeah, it was on slideshow. Okay. Yeah, sure that works. Yeah. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Go for it. Um, thank you. So, sorry for the slight um, uh, lag. Um, uh, hearing what Ute uh, had been saying, I, I had almost second thought that I'm going to lose my research, <laughs> my capacity to pursue my own research on Roman, on Roman coins. For hopefully, I'll, I'll keep a few minutes um, uh, on Sunday nights, or <laughs> and 20 years from now, I'll be able to find um, a, a new victim. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this seems to be as well my last report as a, um, as deputy director. It has it has been a honor of uh, learning uh, under uh, Uta's um, uh, directorship, um, learning to help the NS better, and I'll try to reflect this um, during that report. So um, it will be stru structured uh, first with money talks and NS. Uh, um, uh, events, then the conventions, research, and perspective. So, money talks, we had eight of them during the uh, last uh, calendar year, or actually INS year, because it's not quite calendar, it's more like the ac uh, an academic <coughs> year, actually. Um, that covered medallic art. Uh, we had uh, Professor Dunham as a, a visiting professor delivering a, a fantastic uh, talk on the uh, nation building imagery in Mexico and in Americas, more generally speaking, uh, how to publish a book. Um, we had French coinage in the Americas uh, from someone who is sitting uh, here <laughs> in the first rank. And um, Hellenistic coinage. Um, the numismatic walking tour of Manhattan actually was not part of the money talks this year, but, but happened as part of the uh, NS summer seminar, so it's a slight uh, mistake. So some some picks from this year money talks. You will um, so it's a mixture of um, shots during the talks and uh, of the uh, announcement we we made. Um, this is the uh, the numismatic uh, walking tour with Peter. It's it, it happens in July, so it's pretty <laughs> pretty hot as you can see. Maybe um, our most successful uh, event is the uh, wine and coin, which will happen this year, I believe, I think it's December 14th, yes, uh, where we will be pairing again, uh, or tripling, I should say, uh, coins, food, and wine uh, at VNS. Uh, usually we're fully booked, so uh, don't wait for too long if you're around on the, on the 14th. Uh, that was the year before this one. <laughs> Um, yeah, I see some people <laughs> we know. <laughs> so some of the NS conferences and lectures, so some of them are part of a cycle. As you know, we have uh, a series that happen every year. Um, and we, uh, we are lucky enough to have uh, speakers from different uh, international uh, or US institutions. Um, and the topics are very wide, from American numismatics to, to ancient numismatics or international uh, coins. Um, you will see, so we had a gentleman from the British Museum here. We were not responsible for this. Uh, <laughs> he did that in England before, uh, before joining us for this uh, conference. 
Um, we had some joint uh, events as well. I won't talk about this one because David Yoon will say more about the Visigothic uh, conference a few weeks ago. Um, we had a joint event with Columbia as well that was uh, uh, co-organized uh, by uh, our uh, curator Lucia uh, Carbone. Um, we are as well ho hosting events. So in this case, we had uh, a day with uh, an, um, a t Latin teacher. They, they had their annual gathering in New York. So we invited them for um, a kind of numismatic uh, conversation about Latin and Roman coins. And reciprocally, they offered a table to us at their convention. We had a few new members this way, but it's nice. It's nice to, uh, to be known by the Latin teachers. That's where the next generation of numismatists may, may come from. Not the teachers, but their students, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so numismatic conventions, part of what we do, uh, Ute, um, Mary, myself, Emma, um, is to travel across the US and meet with members. Uh, if we were to stay in New York, well, there are many people we would not see because not everybody has the flexibility and the time to, to travel here. So go touring the convention is a way to, um, to meet with our members in, in various locations, as you will see. Um, so Baltimore, um, this year the ANA, well, well they say Chicago, but I it's an hour outside of Chicago. We didn't go to Chicago, it was Rosemont, uh, close to the airport, which is quite a different uh, venue. Uh, one of our favorite here in Scottsdale, um, obviously the New York International, uh, some pictures of these different shows. Um, they, they are in three different locations here. Maybe um, one of our favorite was this year the, uh, uh, the convention um, of the Larsen uh, Association with, with David Hill giving a presentation on the Dableland Dale Dale archives that we purchased at VNS. Um, these are some of the awards we got this year from the NLG. Um, so Emma, who represented VNS, and uh, Dr. Uh, Catherine Lorber, who received the award that was uh, at the ANA this year. Uh, my favorite picture is this one. I'm, I'm into my favorite activity, which is to um, get um, people to sign mem membership forms, checks, credit cards, cash, we accept everything. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so <laughs> what you don't see on that picture is sometimes we have Mary Lennon behind, making sure the guy doesn't escape. <laughs> So research is a part of my activity that may, I hope, not vanish entirely, but I've, I've been active on different projects, mostly on uh, Roman uh, coinage. So now let's talk about perspective. Um, when Ute strongly suggested I should accept her offer to replace her at some point, um, I was a little bit concerned because Ute is originally a German citizen, I'm a French citizen, and I thought, mm, uh, there's too maybe, maybe too many Europeans in an American institution, it's a little <laughs> weird. And to be honest, if we were in Paris, or I, I don't think a Parisian institution would have had like an American director and then a Russian director, to, you know, to take a, an example like this. There's, there's a sort of more, more nationalistic down there. So, um, and you know, Europe has not been always a, a land of, a peaceful land, so that's... Um, <laughs> using different, um, you know, European countries with their representation. And this kind of European uh, uneasiness or unfriendly relationship <laughs> come from far away. So in antiquity, the Gauls were famous. Uh, do you know Asterix the Gaul? Oh, yeah. yeah, okay. So this is a long tradition of, you know, not agreeing among the, themselves in Europe. And it's still too true today. So you have a bunch of European politicians in recent some meets, I, I particularly like Boris Johnson being lectured by President Macron. Obviously, <laughs> he, he must find this very boring or overwhelming. Um, uh, dear Angela is pretty good with bad faces. I, I'm, I'm sorry, Uta, but <laughs> 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 you, you're more smiling than, than Angela, that's clearly. So you could be sort of worried about this. Now, um, hopefully Vienna is not suffering. We did not export European conflicts in America uh, <laughs> as we did in the 18th century. And these peaks are from the, uh, the consultant we hired to interview um, Vienna staff as part of a strategic 
um, mission we are conducting right now about the future of VNS. Uh, this mission will go to the trustees and, and to the fellows now. But we started with the employees and some of the quotes were very strong. Um, and one of the consultants was here, or Shirley was here this morning, the, the director of a consulting firm. And she was saying that she had never met in her life a firm whose employees felt so much committed, so much part of a family. Um, and I come from the, the corporate sector as well. In my past was uh, as a <laughs> as uh, our uh, chairman uh, knows, we were together at uh, at Berstein's, and which was a very different culture. So, uh, I, I, to some extent, I share uh, our consultant surprise. And every day, I'm like, "Wow, it's so different from what I, I, I've known in the past. It's it's a real family here." And so, I think the French guy now to be part of that team may open some opportunities. And we have been thinking about, you know, re maybe potentially relocating VNS. There have been some strange uh, proposals. But, you know, we could think more widely. And so France <laughs> offers some very nice landscape as well. You could, you could imagine VNS somewhere in one of these places. I'm sure the staff would not resign if we would be um, like here. So sea, mountain, countryside, wine. You <laughs> make your choice. So we. Yeah, it's not necessarily cheap. This is Cassis. This is close to Marseille. Well, um, going forward, we've made a, a several uh, a key decisions, uh, or uh, we are opening some perspective. Uh, so I'd like to congratulate Jesse, who is here, um, to take over the role of US curator, a role that had been empty, or a seat that had been empty for too long. Um, you have our uh, part-time um, accountant and controller uh, here, Cassandra, who is doing an extraordinary job uh, for us. We are looking for, as we are as well looking for a curatorial assistant in the ancient Greek department, and we were overwhelmed by the number of of, of uh, uh, candidates. We have like 20 candidates for that for that position, and we have a project as well. I mean, hopefully that will materialize at some point. Uh, of possibly minting uh, commemorative medals in gold and silver that would use the image of some of the rare coins the NS owns. And there may be potential for um, selling them to the community of collectors. Uh, we know the Smithsonian did that in the past. And it could be a six-figure business for the NS, which is not something that would be unwelcome. So I think I'm done. <laughs> I, um, there we are. This is the um, membership and development department. Um, I'm Eshel Kreider, the director of development. And um, it's a pleasure and privilege uh, to be here. And um, it's wonderful to see so many of you. And this annual meeting always gives us the opportunity to give you an overview of the projects and other activities that your membership and contributions financial and otherwise help us to support. Uh, I always think of this as a collaborative enterprise. And like with many partners, we want to recognize and thank you for the help that you gave us to make this a successful year. Uh, the contributions picture, as been mentioned before, is uh, quite remarkable this year. Donations total more than 1,600,000. And together with your membership dues, that actually takes us over um, one million seven hundred and forty thousand dollars and this total um, includes a small but significant number of large gifts that have been received for very specific projects for example the second this is the second year of a three-year grant from the national endowment for the humanities for the hellenistic roman coinages online databases we also received a large six-figure donation as Uda mentioned, from an anonymous foundation in support of the Medallic Art Company uh, Mako project. Um, and um, we have another three or so 
extraordinarily generous individuals who each gave donations in the six-figure range in support of specific projects or an underserved area of the society, including support for the endowment of the Curator of Medieval and Renaissance Numismatics, for example, as well as other donations to our general fund that directly fund projects undertaken this year. This incredible generosity is together with smaller but no less critical uh, support, which comes from many of you here today and others in the community, provide the vital foundation that ensures the society's well-being. So we all thank you and are deeply grateful for this show of faith in the importance of what the ANS is doing. Um, here's just some of the projects that uh, are funded uh, this year. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, where our members come from. Uh, so this map gives you a general sense of the geographical reach of uh, those who are members today and uh, some of you who have been members for really decades. Um, we are honored uh, by this show of dedication and we often acknowledge those people who have reached significant milestones of 25, 30, and 40 years and quite remarkably a half century of continuous membership in the ANS. Uh, those who have now reached this 50-year mark are recognized as life members. Uh, and we are happy to report that this year nine people, nine members, have joined this group of uh, 76 others to be in this uh, rather elite group of uh, ANS devotees. Uh, we are also pleased to welcome 133 new members this year. Uh, they hail from across the U.S. and around the world. And uh, one of the people that often greets our members is our membership associate, Emma Pratt. Uh, people have talked about her before, but I just want to ask Emma to stand up for those of you who are new. And, uh, Make sure you have a chance to say hello. And she was uh, a big uh, part of the annual report and how beautiful it is, is really a product of uh, one of Emma's many talents. And I thank her for that. Um, people also uh, come to the ANS uh, to view our collection digitally. And um, you can see from this slide that there's a, a quite range of age groups. Uh, a range of countries, and as we expand our digital presence, we've seen a significant increase in the number of visitors to our website and other social media platforms. For example, our website, numismatics.org, was visited this year by 269,135 unique users, and this is an increase of 39% from the year before, which is, I think, quite a testament to all the work that's being done uh, to promote our presence online. Around 41% of those visitors are from the United States, which means 59% actually hail from other parts of the world, including a little under 8% from uh, the United Kingdom, almost 4% from Germany, and surprising to me, uh, almost an equal number, 3.88% from India which puts India at number four in a group of 25 countries uh, with the highest number of visitors from around the world, ahead of Italy, Canada, and sorry, Gilles, France, uh, for <laughs> example. So um, that uh, group of people that we're reaching around the world is, is really quite impressive and continues to change and expand and move around. Um, Hmm. I'm actually, one uh, slide seems to be out of order, so I'm just going to move to the gala. Um, the ANS calendar has this wonderful uh, celebration yearly. Um, last January, Friends of the Society gathered in New York City to celebrate uh, ANS fellow and former trustee Mike Gesvoda. Uh, this is a particular event. Um, which allows members to come together and <coughs> and uh, and and 
socialize um, in this beautiful environment and also raises significant money for, for the society. Um, it's now held at the Harvard Club here in New York and we're looking forward to returning there again in 2020. Uh, the 2020 gala will take place on Thursday, January 16th, and will honor our colleague and former board member from California, Rick Bellison, with the Trustees Award. So I hope you'll mark your calendars. Um, Bellison has been a steadfast supporter of the ANS for many years, ever since joining the society in 1995. He served on the Board of Trustees from 2010 to 2016, <coughs> And he's always been a generous donor to many of our appeals, including the society's campaign to endow the chair of the executive director. Um, so if you can come, I know it'll be a very festive and engaging evening. And um, for some reason, my slide of uh, one other thing I wanted to talk about has disappeared, which is um, I want to just mention before I, I turn this over to David uh, Hill, that um, there's a group of ANS members that are part of the Augustus B. Sage Society, and every year they have an opportunity to travel abroad and uh, spend some time together, get to know each other better, meet some other colleagues. This year they went to Malta, and uh, I want to thank specifically, particularly, uh, Mary Lannan for leading that trip and being instrumental in helping us put that trip together and bringing us our first new member from Malta, who's now our one and only Maltese uh, member of the society. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Okay, let's see, okay. Yeah, I'm David Hill. I'm the librarian and archivist, I think, as most of you know. Um, as Gilles mentioned, uh, money talks. We started off the year um, with a money talk in the library, and I presented that on the history of the ANS. We, it was an opportunity to look at some of the so society's archival documents, including an invitation to the society's first meeting in 1858, a letter from the civil rights leader and sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois, and another from Southern States President Jefferson Davis in which he talked about a Confederate half dollar that he owned. Uh, in the spring, we had another opportunity to show off our library treasures when Ken Soner, uh, chief librarian at the um, uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art, came down with a Friends of the Library group to see uh, our library as well as to um, go to a presentation of the coins by curator Peter Van Alphen. As you also mentioned, uh, in May, I traveled with him to represent the ANS at the Early American Coppers Convention in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, we, at the, the Society co-sponsored an event there honoring large scent expert Del Bland, who died in two, uh, 2018. And I had the opportunity to talk about Del's many accomplishments and his vital role really in helping the Society with, with its own large scent collection. Uh, as I reported last year, an important part of Dell's research <coughs> archives has been acquired by the ANS, and the Society delayed the releasing these materials for a period of time. And that was to give collectors who might be identified in them time to uh, say that they would like their names redacted and not given to the public. And after that period passed, they are now available to researchers. And here's our own Jim Nicewinner, who is with us today, using those very materials. Although there are strict rules uh, prohibiting scanning and reproduction, and the notebooks have to be used in person, and they cannot be, uh, they will not be scanned for online online use. Uh, while the bland notebooks won't be online, uh, we have been putting all kinds of different <coughs> historical materials online in the, through the Newman Portal and Internet Archive, thanks to the work of Laura Jacobs. Uh, we now have over 8,000 library and archives items accessible online. And just some examples of these things that went online in the last year. Uh, one item I added this year is the first edition of Samuel Hudson Chapman's book on 1794 cents, which has these kind of amusing uh, annotations and scathing comments from large cent collector George Clapp, uh, the donor of the ANS's collection of large cents. Also, uh, in the 1970s, the ANS limited access to Clapp's collection, and they produced instead a photographic inventory. And they used to sell fo uh, photocopied reproductions of this to researchers. And this is now available online. 
Uh, something else that went online this year are these uh, Worthington Bittler notebooks. Um, these document his collection of large scents he put together from 1945 to 1960. They have clippings, personal notes, and plates cut from auction and sale catalogs. And we added additional notebooks to those that we have already scanned and put online for, from the legendary collector Virgil Brand. And one example of crowdsourcing, researcher Saul Teichman has used Brand's notebooks online to create indexes for several thousand of the most important and significant pieces. There's a wealth of information waiting to be discovered in these notebooks. Uh, just before these were scanned and put online, Wayne Burt here was using them when he stumbled onto material filling in the gaps uh, in the known ownership of Eric Newman's favorite coin, the 1792 Gold Eagle owned by George Washington. And this is uh, what they look like online, so anybody can go there and use them at any time. Last year I reported on the slow but steady progress of the rehousing of our Chapman Brothers correspondence, and I'm happy to say that things are really moving rapidly now because the Newman portal has taken over this work. And finally, after years of slow reorganization, uh, we, we got these materials in 2002. Uh, these important letters are becoming accessible, and these two can, are beginning to be found online. I think we're through maybe the letter H, you know, they're, they're alphabetical. As we work to make these materials available, we're always adding to our collections. Thanks to Newman Portal coordinator Len Augsburger, the ANS has received 11 boxes of Eric Newman's papers uh, from Washington University, the collector's alma mater. These mostly document Newman's work as an ANS trustee, particularly his efforts to identify and recover stolen items from the Society's collection of large scents. We also received four boxes of Newman records from longtime library friend, also with us today, Anthony Terranova including correspondence on colonial and confederation era coins, tokens, and medals, and some volumes annotated by Newman. David Tripp, author of a book on the 1933 Eagle, has given the ANS 13 boxes of research files and documents relating to the famous court battle involving the coins, along with the funding to employ library assistant Harriet Williams to process the collection. These materials will have to be reviewed before they are made available for research. Michael Sullivan here on the left who came in with his kids and paper currency researcher uh, Bruce Hagen. Um, he has donated, he added significantly to an earlier donation that he made giving the library a number of 19th and 20th century books, papers, pamphlets, newspapers, and archival items relating to counterfeiting, counterfeit detection, and banknote reporting. And here's some examples from that, uh, the latest donation. The library later acquired at auction this extremely rare 1862 booklet on counterfeiting by engraver and anti-counterfeiter Waterman Lily Ormsby. These materials are already finding use. This is Patrick Parkinson and Susan Strange who recently came in to do research uh, for a book they're doing on counterfeit detectors. Some donations are unexpected and unconventional. Uh, new, new member Burton Strauss stopped in to use some boxes of newspapers, and these things are uh, very high up, and I always had to drag out this ladder, and I was forever complaining about this rickety ladder that was always you know, knocking into my knees and everything when I was using it. So a couple of days later, I was surprised and grateful to find that a lightweight and sturdy ladder was delivered courtesy of Mr. Strauss. So other donations and acquisitions of note include these books on Soviet Union numismatics by Adran Adrian Coldiron, who has also contributed to the curatorial collection. Uh, every year we get these, uh, the newest in Whitman publications uh, sent by Dennis Tucker. We're very grateful for that. We initiated new book exchanges this year with institutions in the Czech Republic and Poland. And we acquired an elaborate, and I must say expensive, two-volume set on Chinese uh, cash coins in exchange for the author's use of photographs of coin trees from the ANS collection. I must thank David Yoon for doing a lot of work to get that done. Uh, numismatic bookseller David Fanning was recently in to do some research for a book, and he's been helping to sell some of our library duplicates, and this helps to generate funds to purchase new materials. When I mentioned to uh, David that the library lacked a copy of the famous Leonard Holland large scent uh, sale catalog, he generously found a copy to donate. As in the past, I wrote an article for each issue of the ANS magazine this year, digging up new information in the archives for each. Uh, the topics this year were the sculptor uh, Jules Edouard Wanet and the beginnings of the Medallic Art Company, uh, the notebooks of ANS co-founder Edward Groh, which are now available online. 
correspondence of dealer Thomas Elder, and an ANS medal done by Herman McNeil. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who has helped out in the library in the last year, our part-time cataloger, James Woodstock, our volunteer interns, Carmen Laidler, who began as a high school student with us, and she returned uh, after her first year of college. Sarah Ann Adams, a library school student at Pratt, who has worked as a fellow in the Museum of Modern Art. Leah Car Carlson Downey, also at Pratt, who has worked in the libraries of the Whitney Museum and Baruch College. And Jared Goldfarb, who wasn't a library student actually when he started with us, but he has since enrolled at Queens College of uh, Library and Information Studies. Okay, so I would like to thank everyone who has donated to the library in the past year. Again, I'm happy to say I have two slides worth of people. And thank you very much. And I believe I'm turning it over to our chief curator. Oh, I think I'm to our I'm director. <laughs> to, I will now put my Andrew Weinhardt Director of Publication, and I, I have to ring it somewhere because it appears Andrew, um, who's been ill, quite ill all week, sent in his slides but was not able to make it. So, um, but that gives me the opportunity to give um, his report. And um, I've those of you who've um, seen Andrew, I could not even begin to um, make up his style of presentation, so I'll keep it very brief. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but Andrew has been extremely busy um, putting together uh, publications and um, this is a year where t in, in the actual year two publications appeared um, while he's preparing um, a whole slew of them. Um, one of them is um, this um, volume of essays in honor of our former chief curator um, William Metcalf. Um, it's an extremely impressive volume, um, some of the authors of the volume here in this room. Um, the second book um, that has appeared during this year is the um, Nablus 1968 Horde, um, written by um, Heim Gittler and Orntal, um, based on the work of some other ANS, former ANS members, including Arnold Speer, Sylvia Horta, um, as well as Dana Ashkenazi and Arden Stern. Um, extremely important publications. Um, I will go forward. Um, there I should say he is preparing a whole bunch of other um, books that um, are <coughs> delayed so in some cases um, being largely a fault of my own um, as I'm the author or editor of some of this material. Um, I'm re expecting five or six books um, of which two <coughs> or three are already at the printer in the next uh, four to five months. Um, Anus publications are extremely strong and the magazine um, that you see here one cover it's these uh, three periodicals that we have, of course, the American Journal of Numismatics. And I'm um, here particular thanks to the um, two editors, um, David Yoon being in charge of the uh, post-ancient, if I call it like this, which means everything that isn't ancient, as well as Nathan Elkins. And um, being a former editor of this myself, I have to say it is impressive how this uh, group has now managed to um, pull ahead in this. Um, I don't know whether you're going to say anything about this, David. Um, it is now, um, the AJN now appears, I believe, right at the beginning of the year in which it's supposed to, or in the middle of the year. No, it doesn't. Behind. A little <laughs> bit behind. But at least it doesn't appear two or three <laughs> years behind, as sometimes was in the past. <laughs> um, we're also extremely grateful. Um, the new journal of early American Numismatics, which has, is an extraordinary uh, addition to the ANS publication read it. Um, and um, this is, these three journals really um, pull that um, publication program that appears together. Um, we always put in, obviously, for the awards of the Numismatic Literary Guild, which over the years, as they've um, shrank the number of awards, become more competitive. And so these prizes that um, were won by um, Chris McDowell for uh, Jean, the Journal of Early American Numismatics, as in Best Club or Non-For-Profit Periodical, um, as well as Best Book on World Coins, um, Kathy Loba, who at the same time also won for her really um, master work on the coins of the Ptolemaic em Empire, part one. And we're all hoping part two will come out, but she's, she won these two very prestigious awards. And 
Um, current projects, exactly. If you went into the office, um, because I have to say that this very short report doesn't really give credit what Andrew does. And it's not that he has a, a, a large staff. Oliver Hoover helps him a little bit and he has editors, but he does a lot of these books. And these are the books in here in production that I've mentioned. So these are actually in production. These are books accepted. These are possible books. He juggles all this um, literally all the time. Um, and so we should all thank him um, for, for his hard work. And I will, um, I'm sure he would have expressed all this much more beautifully than I did, but um, I will now hand over to Peter. Thank you. Afternoon. So uh, a great deal of what we do in the curatorial section uh, year on end is to uh, work on these online resources. Uh, one of the key online resources that we contribute to is nomisma.org. And this rather industrial looking site is actually a backbone to a lot of the other uh, online sites that, that we are currently building at the ANS at the moment. Um, all of us on the curatorial staff contribute in one way or another to this. And this is essentially an online numismatic thesaurus. And this is an international collaborative effort um, with us, with people in in Europe and elsewhere in the world. Um, this year we were very happy to welcome several new partners, um, primarily um, small German institutions that are part of this larger consortium in Germany, part of the NUMID consortium. Uh, a lot of our work this year focused on the Hellenistic Royal Coinages Project for which we received a rather substantial uh, NEH grant a few years ago. So we are now entering the third and final year of that, but uh, in the second year, uh, over the course of this last year, we, we added a number of components to this. Um, one of which is uh, this umbrella site, which allows you to search um, the other components, including Pella, which focuses on the coinage of Alexander the Great at the moment, um, uh, um, Seleucid coins online, and Ptolemaic coins online, which I'll t tell you about in just a moment. But if you go to this site, um, the HRC umbrella site, you can search all three of those simultaneously and do um, various types of data mining. And before I forget, um, I, I do want to just acknowledge a number of people who have been working on this over the course of this last year. This includes our data scientist, Ethan Gruber, who is also a major contributor to Nomisma, um, Desnardo Pinella, who is our full-time, or now actually half-time, of uh, assistant on the HRC project, and then Oliver Hoover, Mark Pizik, Gunnar Dumke, and then Alan, uh, who's snapping photos in the back, um, has uh, taken photos, as well as Emma Pratt has also taken photos for that. Towards uh, the end of this last year, November, we launched version two of Seleucid Coins Online, which now inco incorporates all of the material that was in the original print publication of Seleucid Coins, as well as a lot of new varieties. And this is primarily the work of Oliver Hoover, who's been doing a lot of the grunt work on that. Um, we were thrilled uh, this spring in April when the BNF, the Bibliothèque Nationale in France, um, or de France, sorry, in Paris, uh, worked very hard to add about 4,500 of their coins to the um, searchable content on SEO. So now we've got about 10,000 specimens that you can search, and this is you know, continuing to grow. Um, in January of, of this year, we launched um, version one, or part one, of Ptolemaic Coins Online, and this is based on Kathy Lorber's award-winning um, two-volume set that focuses on the coinage up to Ptolemy IV. And we hope um, sometime towards the end of this year or beginning of next year that we are going to include the bronze coinage um, as part of that as well. At the moment, um, this is just the silver and gold coinage. And then once um, part two of her magnum opus is completed, we will then uh, work that into Ptolemaic coins as well. And while I'm looking at this, this great banner, I want to thank Alan Roche again for his work on creating these banners. Um, they, these really are, I think, really quite eye-catching and very nice. Um, this year, uh, we've continued to work on Ochre. This was a uh, previously um, NEH-funded project. Um, Lucia Carboni has taken over most of the responsibility for this. Um, we are thrilled 
to add uh, about 1,500 or 1,400 coins from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Again, you know, a lot of collaboration with other colleagues in various places. Um, now, Ochre has over 125,000 searchable specimens from 37 different collections. I mean, this is really phenomenal and really does, again, underscore the, the amount of international cooperation that goes into um, these, these projects that, that we are building and hosting here. Um, on the Roman Republican side, you know, again, work continues on building out coinage of the Roman Republic online. But the really exciting news on the Roman Republican um, online front is a project that we're hoping to launch fairly soon. Um, this is the work of uh, Dick Schaefer, who has essentially spent a lifetime putting together these dice studies of Roman Republican coins. And he's done, these, done this in these, these big binders, and there are dozens and dozens and dozens of these binders. Um, Dick agreed earlier this year to let us scan all of this, and this is a, a project that uh, Lucia Carboni and uh, Professor Lee Yarrow from CUNY Brooklyn um, organized and got funding for. And so over the course of the summer, all of Dick's bindings were scanned, and we are now in the process of trying to build out um, the, the components of that that we need to then incorporate these dye studies into Crow. The coinage of the Roman Republic online, and this is going to be a phenomenal addition to this. This will allow then people to go to Crow to search for specimens, to search for find spots, hoard information, and at the same time do die studies or look over the die study um, data. Um, in terms of our online resources, some interesting statistics. Uh, Michelle mentioned earlier that India is is up and coming in terms of overall searches on uh, numismatic.org, but in terms of Mantis, which is our online search uh, engine, India is number two after the United States, um, followed then by the United Kingdom, Germany, and Italy as, as uh, the top five. Uh, in terms of the demographics, um, curiously, perhaps, um, most of the age group um, that, that is searching Mantis is right in the late 20s, early 30s, and then you can see start to drop off. Um, Perhaps not so surprisingly, about 70% of the searchers seem to be male and, and about 30% female, but hopefully we can try to balance that out a little bit more going forward. Um, in case you wanted to know, the most searched coin this year on Mantis was this uh, dinar of Kushra II. So let's hear it for Sasanian numismatics. <coughs> yeah, exactly. Um, research, of course, is a, another major component of what we do. Um, uh, Elena and David will talk about their own research in a moment. In terms of my own, I've continued to focus on archaic coinage as well as medallic art. And, um, as, uh, and we, we do right now, we mean myself and Uta have this massive tome which we are hoping will be out by the end of the year. In fact, it better be out because it's already <laughs> advertised on Amazon. <laughs> so <laughs> the pressure is on. Um, Lucia is not with us today because she is still on maternity leave. Um, she'll be back uh, the week after next, um, and I'd like to congratulate her again on the birth of her daughter, Ella Sheba, um, back in August, August 28th. Um, but in the meantime, before, in fact, she left on maternity leave, she had an incredibly busy year uh, working on uh, finalizing the manuscript um, on her book on late cystophoric um, coinage, as well as uh, continuing plugging away on a, uh, on a book um, on the coinage of what we're calling RPC zero. You know, this is uh, coinage um, from the Roman controlled provinces, um, uh, coinage that uh, was a, of a tremendous interest to our late colleague Rick Wichonki, and it's his collection of roughly 4,000 coins that were donated um, to the ANS that uh, form the core of this manuscript that she's currently working on. Now, um, Eric Kraus, Dr. Kraus, who is a curatorial associate, has been um, busy at work on a project on the Goldbrecht dollars, and I need to read this because otherwise I'm not going to get it correct, I know. Um, he, he's come up actually with an incredibly clever way of um, looking at the die alignment 
um, which um, I'm sure he'll be happy to uh, talk to you about and or even demonstrate. But um, he says that with, with an instrument of his own invention, he has obtained precise dial alignment measurements within one degree of accuracy on 78 Goldbrecht dollars held at the ANS. And here, these little dots, you see a representative scatter plot for the Judd 60 variety. Each point represents a single specimen and shows the location of the 12 o'clock position of the obverse die in relation to the reverse die landmarks. Now, Dr. Krauss um, will correlate these data with die marker information to refine the proposed emission sequence for this enigmatic series, as most of you know, in a future publication. So I'm, I'm waiting, actually, to see how this all turns out. I think this is incredibly clever and will hopefully resolve a lot of um, outstanding problems. Um, we also do a great deal with education. Uh, this year we welcomed half a dozen school groups, um, one of which was, uh, ca came as far away as, as Florida. Um, these school groups tend to be um, high school age, but we've, we've also had kids as young as uh, third graders um, here um, uh, with us in, in the past. Um, the Eric P. Newman Graduate Summer Seminar, of course, is our, our major um, educational enterprise. Um, this year we welcomed uh, Dr. Evangeline Marku from Athens, Greece, uh, as our Eric P. Newman Visiting Scholar. And uh, once again, Eric Roche, uh, I'm sorry, Alan Roche, um, took the uh, class photo. And it just so happened that he took the photo on a day in Central Park in the Sheep Meadow um, while we were having a picnic when there happened to be other animals prancing around besides the sheep. <laughs> so, <laughs> like this unicorn. Um, Again this year, I, I spent a couple of, uh, some time in Antalya, Turkey, um, teaching in the Ahmed Monetary History and Numismatics Seminar there. Um, this is a wonderful experience for me to spend some, some time in Turkey. As, as some of you know, my wife is Turkish, and so I feel you know, a great uh, deal of attachment to the, to, uh, the country itself. And um, this center, uh, part of Koç University, is uh, run by uh, Professor Dr. Oz Tekin, who you can see right here standing with me in uh, a doorway at the site of per, uh, Perge. Um, Oz, uh, Do uh, Professor Tekin, as, as most of you know, is our Huntington awardee for um, 2019. And I hope that you'll join us on November 8th when we will have a ceremony awarding um, the, the prize to him. Um, there seems to have been a, a slide that dropped out, but I just want to mention uh, the MAKO uh, project. One other thing that uh, Ethan Gruber and I did this year was to write another NEH proposal um, to fund a project that we are calling the Art Medal in America. And this will hopefully, collect the fingers crossed if we, if we get the funding, we'll be able to start building out a, a website based on uh, the Art Medal in America using the MAKO material to begin with and um, over the course of the next several years um, we'll be able to build yet another online resource devoted to this and regardless of whether or not we get the funding we'll, we'll certainly try to do that but please cross your fingers for, for that. We should find out sometime in April. So now I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Elena Stoyark who is our collections manager wherever she She's in the wings. Here she comes. Right, thank you. Yes. Wonderful. Okay, good evening. And as you can see from this small collage on the screen, during this fiscal year, the NS Coin Cabinet acquired interesting and important objects through generous gift as well as purchases. And we would like to express our deep appreciation to all of our donors who continue to fill gaps in our collection. And we acknowledge and thank them all. Some of these notable gifts must be singled out for special mention. The NS benefactors, Abraham and Marion Shores Affair, donated more than 600 ancient bronze and silver coins from the cities of Judea, Samaria, and the Decapolis. Although in this year's affairs the nation is a remarkable and very rare set of 11 stone and bronze weights from the 8th, 7th century BCE, as well as a group of early American uh, Islamic coins and a crusader lead seal of the Knights Hospitallers, probably from Jerusalem, I don't know. Uh, they are very grateful 
to have received from the Kenneth Edler, our chairman of the board of trustees, a group of coins from the former Archon Huntington collection of the Hispanic Society of America. Among these objects is a group of 20 gold discs, a type of ghost money, occasionally found in burial sites, 1,300 Celtiberian coins, and over 1,200 Castilian balloon coins. From the Edlo family fund, the NS acquired 340 French medieval and modern gold, silver, and copper coins. The Edlo family fund also donated from the Archer Huntington collection a very important group of almost 6,000 Islamic coins. These coins provide a unique source of historic information, and we are very grateful for this very generous gift. NS member Donald Canapara involved the society collection of Latin American coinage <coughs> with his gift of a very rare silver eight realis of Charles de Sot, dated 1760 from the Santa Fe de Bogota mint. Prior to the discovery of this coin, only three dates were known for pillar eight realis produced by this mint. Former NS president and honorary trustee, I don't know if he came, no, I did not see him, Roger Siboni donated a coin of great rarity as Summer Island's present date, the Bermuda uh, shilling of the large sale variety, one of the first British coins struck to use in the Americas and these unquestionably rare historical artifacts uh, documents the beginning of British colonization in the Americas. This summer, with a gift from Society Fellow Frank Kovac, the NS purchased an interesting group of American military medals and society badges previously lacking in our collection. Among them is a very rare example of an Indian Wars campaign medal a delegate badge of the Society of Colonial Wars issued in May 1899, the very rare insignia of the ancient heraldic and chivalric Order of Albion, which claimed to have been instituted in, instituted in 1643, a 7th Regiment of New York State National Guard medal, and a very curious rectangular gold medal of the 40 and 8th Society of Veterans, it was named for the French boxcar 40 and 8, used during World War I to transport 40 soldiers, 40 men, and 8 horses to the front. This is very interesting. <laughs> the NS fellow Scott Miller and his wife Rosalind Miller enriched our medal collection with a beautiful plaster relief of 1850 of unfortunately unknown woman. This portrait is a work of Salethiel Ellis, one of the most notable early medalists in the United States. From NS fellow J. Galst, the Society received a bronze medal commemorating the outstanding artists and inventors, Leonardo da Vinci, made in three interlocking parts by the Finnish medalist and sculptor Kauka Rasinen who was awarded the NS Saltus Award in 1986. From longtime member Adron called Iron, the society received a lot of medals and also a collection of over 600, more than 600 pins, badges and buttons with the image of Chairman Mao, produced during the Chinese uh, Cultural Revolution, 1966-1976. These political badges are historically significant icons of the tragic decade that many Chinese call the 10 lost years. Another interesting piece from the Mr. Carl Iron gift is a bronze medal from the Soviet Union Leningrad mint issued by a very famous sculptor with a facing image of Yuri Gagarin which commemorates the first human space flight on April 12, 1961. 
In the same year, the United States started the Apollo program, which succeeded in landing the first human on the moon in 1969. Through donation from our trustee Mary Lennon, we receive a proof $5 gold coin issued by the US Mint in celebration <coughs> of the 50th anniversary of this first human moon landing. I just want to mention that I very well remember these two special events which really make very proud human around the world. And what has really impressed people at that time, I live in Soviet Union, of course, that it was very small note in Russian main mm, newspaper, Gazeta Pravda, very small note about this uh, Apollo 11 moon landing. But was imp what impressed people they really did not understand what they put in this note, that American left on the moon some message that we came in peace from all mankind. And this is very touch people, because not from American, not from, you know, personal, but from all mankind, you know, this is, was very touchable. And people in Soviet Union at that time was really, really very excited about this flight. Uh, another aspect of our curatorial department activities is the NS Museum Loan Program. Currently, 417 objects are out on loan on permanent uh, traveling and uh, exhibition. And uh, as usually, curatorial staff provided uh, consultation for the borrowing institution. And here are some recent highlights which I want you to see. In the beginning of this fiscal year, the George Washington's Mount Vernon Educational Center opened a special temporary exhibit, War and Peace in Miniature. Over 30 ANS medals on display present the Committee Americana series, a group of rare Indian peace medals, and the extremely rare season medals which promoted the adoption of European-style agricultural life. The exhibit also presents several uh, objects of Thomas Jefferson Peace Medals, which featuring the profile portrait of the head of state, symbolically connecting a person, con uh, his connection to the president. It was the uh, main goal of this issue. At the end of January, the Block Museum of Art uh, at Northwestern University in Illinois opened an exhibit entitled Caravan of Gold, which explored the culture and economic exchanges that were stimulated by trade across the Sahara Desert in the medieval period. The exhibit includes ANS coins that signify how West African gold was integrated into the global economy through centers of trade in Italy and England. Uh, this past spring, the Art Institute of Chicago opened a newly renovated gallery of Greek, Roman, and Byzantine art. One of the new displays is dedicated to the Tetrarchy, a system established by Diocletian in which rule over the massive Roman Empire was shared between four men, two in the east and two in the west. The Art Institute has its own three wonderful coins on, of the Tetrarchy members, Diocletian, Maximian, and Galerius. The loan of the NS coin of Constantius I completed the set on display. It's how we help our colleague. In March, the exhibit, The Vault Between Empires, World mm. Art and Identity in the Ancient Medieval East. It's a wonderful exhibit. It was opened at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This, exhi this exhibition explored the cities and trading network of southwestern Arabia, Nabataea, Judea, Syria, and Mesopotamia, highlighting the varied political and religious identities. NS coins and terracotta tesseri uh, represented th these great centers of trade as well as specific regional traditions. In July, no, in June, the Virginia Museum of History and Culture in Richmond opened an exhibit, the 400 year struggling for black equality. The NS's army of James Medal, also known as a Butler Medal, 
is a crucial part of a section that explores the experience of black soldiers in the Civil War. The Society's example shows museum visitors how the contribution of the U.S. colored troops, as they was officially known, in winning the war and abolishing slavery was recognized. And lastly, in recognition of the gift of their service, I would like to express our sincere and special thanks to our curatorial department volunteers. We deeply appreciate great assistance of Ted Withington, who has helped us with different curatorial functions for over 30 years, maybe more. We want to thank our board chairman, Ken Edlow, who helps so, um, supervise our guests as they study society's collection. We appreciate the devoted work of the NS Curatorial Associate for the United States Collection, Eric Krause. We also would like to thank Scott Miller for his dedicated help in our medal department. Thank you all, our dear friends, our volunteers, for your priceless work and generous support. And thank you all for your attention. <laughs> now my colleague, David Yoon, will take and continue. Okay, there's been a lot going on in the medieval and modern departments uh, this year, and also in the Islamic, South Asian, and East Asian departments. Here are just a few of the highlights. By far the most important addition to, this to our collection this year, as Elena already mentioned, has been the gift of the entire collection of Islamic and South Asian coins formerly belonging to Archer M. Huntington and the Hispanic Society of America. Comprising almost 6,000 coins, mostly from Islamic Spain, this is a unique and irreplaceable research resource for the study of medieval Spain and the Western Islamic world. We are very grateful to the Edlo Family Fund for this magnificent donation. We also continue to receive important medieval coins from the former Huntington collection. This year, Kenneth Edlow and the Edlow Family Fund donated a large group of late medieval Castilian coins as well as a very important group of around 300 medieval French gold coins, an area of which we previously had only a few. Two other notable accessions to mention include a tremissus of the early medieval Swavian kingdom, of a very rare type <laughs> whose historical interpretation is actively debated, and a spectacular addition, <coughs> gift of Alan Helms, um, to our collection of traditional African exchange valuables, prestige objects, and insignia of rank. I'm continuing to work with our photographer, Alan Roach, on the large project of getting images of our 16th and 17th century Central European coins online. In addition to spectacular silver tallers, this includes many other interesting types of pieces, such as the debased low-value coins of the famous Kippe und Wippe site of the 1620s. We have also been able to add images of more than 2,000 modern struck Chinese coins to our database, thanks to Numismatic Guarantee Corporation and Mark Salzberg. Much of NZ NGC's interest in these coins is because our collection was mostly formed before the 1930s, close to the time of issue. I also continue to work on the task of improving the provenance information in our database for the early Chinese spade and knife-shaped money. For visitors coming to study the collection over the past year, a major theme has been return visits. Many researchers find that there is more here than they expected, and one visit just isn't enough for their research. Daishi Chieda of Doho University in Japan returned to record our Japanese Hansatsu currency. Andrew Kurt of Clayton State University in Georgia returned to finish a book on the monetary economy of Visigothic Spain. And, and Diane Wolftal of Rice University in Texas returned to work on an exhibit um, on money in the Middle Ages that she is curating for the Morgan Library and Museum. Mm. Now, volume 31 of the American Journal of Numismatics has fallen behind schedule due to the large number of publications projects this year, but I can assure you that the issue is almost ready for the printers. Meanwhile, Nathan Elkins and I are getting volume 32 ready for production featuring articles on everything from early Cypriot coinage to Caribbean countermarks. 
In September, the ANS hosted a conference on coinage and economy of the early medieval Mediterranean. Organized by Michael Kelly of Binghamton University and Andrew Kurt of Clayton State University, this conference focused on the monetary economy of Visigothic Spain in its Mediterranean context. The attendees were pleased to have the opportunity to study examples from the ANS collection, the foremost collection of Visigothic coinage in the world. The papers from this conference will be published in an open access format. And in addition to research on Visigothic coins, I have also been working on medieval archaeology in southern Italy. Despite increased volcanic activity, <laughs> as you can see, I returned to the island of Stromboli um, to excavate um, this summer. The site continues to yield more coins, and my colleagues and I presented a paper last winter on the Roman and medieval evidence from the site, including coins, ceramics, and structures. So I will now hand over to Sid Martin for closing remarks. As I think everyone can see, it has been a very busy and productive year for your society. Uh, you've seen what we're doing, what it's meant for others, our outreach, how people are going to use our assets. I mean, we are really something spectacular. I don't have a whole lot more to say. I thank you again for coming. Uh, if there are any burning questions that you'd like to ask, feel free. I, I or someone can try to answer them. If not, I think we have refreshments and things set up outside. So, thank you. <laughs>